Okay. So, welcome to this third lecture of this course. Um, this lecture, uh, the title of this lecture is Threats to Digital Wellbeing. Um, let me see if I have started the recording. Yes. Okay. Um, so, in the first lecture, we had an introduction to the topic. Then, in the second lecture, we analyzed current strategies for promoting digital well being. Um, today, we will try to learn um, how tech companies uh, capture our attention um, in contemporary digital services. Uh, so, we will try to explore. Um, this kind of attention capture design patterns and we will learn that attention capture can be by design so can be a deliberate decision of a tech company uh, to capture the attention of the user and maximize for example advertisement revenue uh, and while learning these approaches that are adopted by contemporary tech companies we can also maybe reason about for example uh, your projects that are trying to develop in the uh, assignment number two uh, to see if through our projects, through our digital self-control tools, we can actually focus on some of, this kind of these uh, patterns and try to mitigate uh, their disruptive effects on, on digital well-being. Uh, so to summarize, we will learn how tech companies exploit psychological vulnerabilities of the users to keep them uh, on their platforms. Uh, but before uh, analyzing uh, attention capture dark patterns, uh, so th this picture summarizes what we have seen in the previous lectures. For example, NIT finding, we have seen um, some NIT finding methods to analyze some uh, interaction between users and digital platforms. Uh, we are trying right now in assignment two to prototype something and in particular a digital self-control tool. Um, next, in the next lecture we will see some uh, design guidelines uh, specifically related to the digital well-being topic. Uh, today, today again it's I think more related to, to analysis so we will analyze um, in, in this human-centered design process contemporary uh, digital services looking for uh, potential issues. Uh, related to uh, digital well-being. So again, uh, before moving to attention capture their patterns, um, we should actually learn uh, what is a design pattern. Uh, I know that some of you probably um, has a design background or no? No, okay, so <laughs> uh, there are some students with a design background in this course, but probably they are not here. Do you know what is a design pattern? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so design patterns are uh, well-known, well-proven solutions. So not only well-known, but solutions that have been tested before by other researchers, designers, uh, that solve uh, commonly recurring problems. Okay? So there is a problem uh, that is well-known, also the problem is well-known, and we know that previously some researchers, some designers have successfully adopt, adopted a, a given solution and we can try to reuse this kind of solution because we know that this solution is working for solving this specific problem. Okay? This is a generic definition of a design pattern that can be, of course, adapted to many different domains. We, we, we are looking in particular in the domain of uh, user interfaces in this case. So uh, design patterns suggest a specific solution for a specific problem. Um, the solution, again, has been tested by, by others, researchers, designers, companies, uh, and the solution, of course, can be reused. So this reuse feature is one of the main advantages of having a, a design pattern. So design is about solution, right? So we design something uh, as a solution for, for a given problem. 
Unfortunately, designers uh, and also programmers in particular often try to reinvent things. Okay, so uh, they start from scratch. Maybe there is already a solution, uh, but yeah, I start from scratch and I start uh, designing my, uh, my code and my user interface. But if we reinvent things every time, then it's hard to know, uh, for example, how things were done before, uh, why things were done in a certain way before, and, and obviously if we reinvent things every time, then it, it's hard to reuse solutions, right? Because every time we start from, from scratch. Uh, and so here comes the, uh, the topic of design patterns. Uh, and design patterns were, were first used in architecture, okay? Uh, and the idea was introduced by Christopher Alexander, who was an architect, uh, who defined the uh, design pattern in this way. Each pattern describes a problem that occurs over and over, so the well-known problem, um, in our environment. So there is also this concept of context. The context uh, is important when speaking about uh, design patterns, and then describes the core of the solution to that problem. Not the specific solution, but the solution in general, in such a way that you can use this solution a million times over without ever doing it in the same way twice. So it's not a very specific solution that refers to specific technologies. It's a general description of a solution that you can implement in several different ways. Uh, obviously, uh, by remaining compliant with, with the generic uh, design pattern. So uh, they are a way to communicate uh, two things mainly, not only the solution but also the problem. Um, and again, they are not too general and not too specific so that we can reuse it uh, by uh, implementing it in different ways. Uh, and they can also become a shared language. As we will see, uh, design patterns are typically described in um, a generic way without using uh, too complex languages. Uh, so design patterns may be a standard reference for designers. Uh, they allow for debate over alternatives um, because just mentioning the name of a design pattern uh, implicitly uh, means thinking about not only, again, the solution, but also about the problem. Uh, and they are typically readable by non-experts because they are uh, written in uh, everyday language, typically. So we can think about design patterns. Are you a designer? No. No, okay, so. <laughs> um, so we can think about design patterns as a new literary form. What is a literary form is a sort of uh, contract that exists between the writer and the, and the reader. So for example, uh, a letter uh, typically has the same, a, a given template, right? So also emails. It, it starts with dear blah, blah, blah. Then there is some, the subject, for example, in emails. And then a letter ends with some letter closing, best regards, and so on, and maybe your signature, OK? So this is uh, the template of a letter. Uh, and we know that. If we are reading a letter, the template probably is this one, okay? So we can think about design patterns as a new literary form, okay? A sort of contract between designers and, and users. So they define certain things to be in a certain place uh, with a certain meaning. Um, and how these design patterns are described? Well, uh, this is... These are two screenshots taken from uh, the Christopher Alexander book, so the architect that introduced this, uh, this concept of design patterns. Um, and we can say that design patterns uh, are still described in this way, if they are described well, uh, also in other domains. Um, so this is a design pattern proposed in, by Christopher Alexander in his book. It's uh, a book about uh, I think hundreds of design patterns related to uh, architecture. Um, and this is the sitting wall uh, pattern. Uh, the name already suggests what this kind of pattern is. And 
the pattern is described in this way. There is a name, a sitting wall, that already conveys the meaning of, of the design pattern. We can easily imagine what is this design pattern. It's a wall uh, or something like this on which I can sit on. Um, then there is an image. Again, here it's... Um, we cannot see well this image, but there is a wall with some users, with some people uh, on top of it. Then there is the context. Again, the context is, is very important because some patterns are useful in some contexts and some other patterns are useful in, in other contexts. Then there is the problem statement, one of the main part of design patterns. Uh, so we describe the problem. In this case, in many places, walls and fences between outdoor spaces are too high. Okay, so this is a problem but no boundary at all does injustice to the... Uh, I cannot read this sentence, but anyway, it, it, it is saying that, okay, uh, we can have too many high uh, walls, but again, having no walls at all, uh, it's also a problem on the other side. So we can find a, a trade-off. Um, then there are uh, some examples of solutions, so how designers, architects have tried before to solve this, this kind of problem. And finally, there is the solution statement, that is a sort of summary of the solutions presented before. In this case, uh, the solution uh, is surround any natural outdoor area and make minor boundaries between outdoor areas with low walls about, and you can also suggest uh, given dimensions, uh, enough to sit on, okay? So this is the proposed solution. And then there are references to other patterns. So you can also try to link these patterns with other similar patterns in the same domain, okay? So this is a sort of well-known and standard template for describing a design pattern. So if you are going to propose a design pattern in whatever domain you want, you should really try to uh, focus and use this, this template. So as we have seen in this example, uh, design patterns solve a problem of conflicting forces. Just to make an example of another pattern by Alexander, uh, we know uh, it's demonstrated that people are naturally drawn towards light, okay? Uh, but they like also to see it. So if you imagine uh, I enter in this room, maybe there is a chair here, and then there is the window. I'm naturally drawn towards the window because there is light coming inside, but I would also like to see it, okay? It's probably an, an exaggeration, but there is this kind of conflicting force so I would like to go towards the window, but at the same time, I would also like to see it. And so Alexander proposed the Alexander window seat pattern that is also uh, implemented here in some ways. So a window uh, near which there is some places to, to sit on, like in this case, okay? And this is another uh, example of design pattern in the architectural context that is still used today and was included in the Alexander book. And we, we know from this pattern that there is this uh, problem of uh, finding a trade-off between different conflicting forces. Um, and these forces of, of no can be of, dif uh, of course, can be of different nature. In this case, uh, these were forces uh, related to uh, biological characteristics of people but you can also have other kinds of conflicting forces, especially in the user interface domain. And starting from these uh, books mainly, and also this edition of the CHI conference, that is the main uh, conference in the human-computer interaction uh, uh, research area, um, design patterns started to be common also in XCI as well. Um, so these are two uh, seminal books by Don Norman. Don't know if you uh, have the, had the opportunity uh, to read them. This one is probably the, the most common. Um, and starting from these books, um, design patterns 
started to become common also in XCI because architecture obviously describes uh, physical environments in which uh, we can live uh, while XCI describes uh, virtual environments through which we can um, communicate in some ways so, so there is uh, a sort of connection between architecture and, and XCI. So we are speaking about uh, UI design patterns related to user interfaces. Um, obviously, each user interface is unique um, and has its own set of goals and, and data. Um, but we do not want to force users to learn every time they open a new interface, new conventions, for example, to operate them. Okay? So through design patterns, we can accelerate uh, the process of learning from, from users uh, to use a given, a given interface, okay? Um, and if you are interested in uh, UI design patterns, you can uh, use this website. Let me see if I can open it. That is a collection of uh, design patterns for user interface design. So, for example, we have some design patterns for uh, getting input. Uh, oops. We have some design patterns for navigation and menus. Uh, we have some uh, patterns for dealing with data, dashboards, galleries slideshows and, and so on. We have also some uh, patterns uh, in the social context, so probably for social networks, uh, the follow pattern, for example, the invite friends pattern, and, and so on. And this is a very brief list of uh, examples extracted from this website just to uh, analyze them very quickly. The accordion menu uh, is this menu that can be expanded. So uh, this is useful when you don't have enough space to show all the items in a menu. So you have this kind of uh, menu that can be expanded and collapsed depending on the, on the clicks of the user. So probably you just show the main items and then if I click on uh, my drive, I can expand all the sub items in this menu and I can go uh, further by clicking on important documents and, and so on, okay? This is the accordion menu, it's common on all the website, I think. The drop-down menu, uh, so Again, it's useful when you have to collapse all the items of a menu behind a unique keyword, a unique label. So I click on my drive and then there is a drop down with the menu. Cards, another uh, design pattern very common, especially in websites, but also in mobile applications. So with cards, you can group uh, elements, coherent elements uh, within a card, uh, as the name suggests. Uh, you can use different colors and cards may contain images, titles, descriptions, buttons, and so on. It's a sort of a grouping element for improving the design of um, uh, user interfaces. Obviously, uh, there are cases in which uh, cards are not suitable, for example, can you imagine uh, when using cards to group, to display elements is not a good idea? Uh, when we have many elements, yes, but you can also implement some pagination with, with cards. So the problem is when uh, the elements that you are uh, showing um, can be ordered. So with cards, 
if you really need to order data according to some criteria, probably cards are not uh, a good idea uh, because you, you lose this, this uh, concept of ordering data with cards. It's more difficult to visually order cards and give a sense of, of ordering with, with cards. Breadcrumbs that are this sort of menus that display two informations, main, mainly the current page, so the page uh, in which you are currently, and also the history of your uh, interaction with, with the platform in a given session, and are useful to allow users to easily go back to a previous section without clicking in other parts of the screen or without performing too many clicks for, for going back. So it's really common, for example, in e-commerce platforms. So here, for example, uh, I'm probably in the payment section, but if I want to go back, I can easily click on one of the uh, items here. And finally, the last example, the hamburger uh, icon menu. Um, again, it's a sort of drop-down menu. It's called hamburger, and it's really common, especially on mobile devices. Uh, because it resembles uh, a real hamburger with two slices of bread with something in the middle, okay? So this is the, uh, the name of this, this pattern. Okay, this uh, was a very brief introduction to uh, design patterns. Uh, let's talk about DAR patterns. So here we are moving from uh, the generic topic of design patterns to a specific kind of design patterns that have been called uh, dark patterns, so deceptive designs that go against the interest of the user. Okay, we are still not speaking about attention capture dark patterns. That is a further focus on this on this topic. We are generally speaking about dark patterns, um, and this term was coined uh, in 2010 by Harry Brignull. That is a design practitioner, um, and the aim of Brignull was to include all those designs that are deliberately, and here the word deliberately is important, adopted to promote choices that are not in the interest of the user, but are in the interest of the digital service that is uh, adopting it. So have you ever experienced a dark pattern in your um, daily usage of your devices and services. Do you know this term, dark patterns? Can you make some examples? Like infinite scrolling? Yeah, infinite scrolling is an example of attention capture dark patterns. We will analyze it uh, later. It's an example. Okay, this could be an example. I don't know if it's included in some of the taxonomy that we will see, but it can be an example. So forcing the user to perform um, an, act an action two times instead of one for some reason. For example, to avoid uh, the user leaving the, the web page, for example. Um, for example, when watching some videos, mm -hmm. Okay, this is another example of attention capture their patterns that is included in a typology, so we will see it. It's a good example. Okay, so uh, we will uh, explore some examples of dark patterns in, in general and then we will move to, towards attention capture. Um, so, Eric Brignull published a gallery of dark patterns that can be uh, accessed here uh, on this website. So, this is the website that is now called Deceptive Design. We will see in a moment why. Uh, and here you have this uh, taxonomy of dark patterns. I think they are 10 or more, I don't remember. Um, so there is a title, as in the 
uh, Alexander template, then a description, uh, and then if you enter a given um, pattern, you can see that there is uh, the same template by Alexander because there is the title, some images, uh, then there is probably the context, uh, the problem, the solution. Again, if you want, you can look at this website to learn more about their patterns. This is an example, the sneak into basket. Um, it's a pattern, yes? Sorry, um, I just wanted to ask you if another example of uh, a pattern was that when I click the English uh, um, uh, an ATM, yeah. uh, there is that um, go next, uh, which has also the light that goes uh, yeah. finishing the time for you to... Yeah, this is another example, again, uh, of attention capture their patterns that are uh, a topic that is new with respect to dark patterns, but we will see this example later. Uh, again, sneak into basket is a pattern through which uh, mainly e-commerce sneak into your uh, shopping basket some elements that uh, you haven't selected. Okay, so for example, I'm buying a smartphone. Okay, I click on, I add the smartphone in my shopping basket and then in the uh, payment section, in the payment page, there is also a protective case for the smartphone, okay? I haven't selected this, this kind of uh, protected case, but it's, it's there. And if I don't delete it from, from, the, uh, from the basket, I'm going to buy it. Uh, and, and this is, of, of course, a problem for the user, right? And here you can see also other examples. For example, on the godaddy.com uh, website that provides you a way to, I think, buy some domain name for your website. Um, probably if you buy a domain name, you also have some other uh, pre-selected items that uh, are in your shopping basket. And if you don't pay attention to this, you will buy some, some items uh, uh, against your, your interest, okay? Uh, there are other examples uh, like the Roche Motel that describes a situation uh, for users that, uh, that is very easy to get into, but then the platform makes it hard for you to get out of this situation. Like, for example, in some services, it's very easy to uh, get a subscription to this service, but then it's really hard to delete your subscription to this, this service. You maybe have to uh, call, for example, some numbers to delete your subscription. You need to provide extra information, okay? So, but if it's easy to get in, I would expect that it's also easy to get out. So, one click and I can cancel my subscription. But this is not true in, in many, many different digital services. So, this is the Roche Motel. Um, okay, privacy zuckering. This is an example of uh, what I was saying before. So, here, names and descriptions are in common language. Here, you can easily uh, guess who is the subject of this, of this uh, uh, design patterns. It, it's probably, it for sure, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, of, um, the CEO of Facebook. And here, this pattern describes examples, uh, patterns through which companies can uh, deliberately, for example, extract from you some privacy private information uh, uh, without your consent, for example, okay? And so on. So let's go back to the slides. And Brignull uh, originally collected these dark patterns through a uh, whole of shame campaign on Twitter using this hashtag that is still common, I think, on Twitter. So if you look on Twitter with this hashtag, you will find a lot of examples even examples that are not included in the original uh, taxonomy. Just a few words about um, language. So originally, the, these patterns were called dark patterns. 
Uh, now, many organizations, as you may know, are moving f away from, the fr from some oppressive terminology that were typically adopted in computer science. Common example are master slave uh, and uh, blacklists uh, that, for example, uh, computer scientists are now using typically block lists instead of blacklists. In the case of dark patterns, the association uh, of dark with ARM uh, is problematic in some way because it may reinforce the racist theoristic of viewing people with darker skin uh, as, as evil, the bad is black effect. So nowadays there are alternative names for this uh, kind of patterns uh, and I think that the most common one is this one, deceptive designs. Okay, so. Uh, also, the website of BrickNull is no longer uh, darkpatterns.org, but is deceptive.design or something like that. Uh, so, okay, this is a picture that summarizes uh, dark patterns and examples of dark patterns. So, to summarize, dark patterns are tricks that make the users do things they did not meant to. Uh, Dark patterns can work uh, in the short term, uh, especially in the perspective of tech companies. Um, however, um, there is this trade-off because obviously using dark patterns may have a negative impact uh, for users, but also typically for tech companies uh, in the long term because uh, users will switch to more ethical products and services in the end. So there is also this trade-off um, that researchers are also trying to uh, make emerge. Um, and these again are some examples of uh, dark patterns that we have already seen in the, in the website. The concept of dark patterns uh, is common nowadays also in, in AXI and the, in the AXI literature and I listed here some interesting uh, papers on this topic. Uh, the first of all is a taxonomy of dark patterns. Um, the second one is an analysis of dark patterns in shopping websites. Then there is this paper that is a comparative study between dark patterns uh, across web and mobile uh, devices. And finally, probably this is the most interesting one, uh, it's an analysis of what makes a dark pattern dark. Because there is clearly a trade-off, there are some patterns that are dark in some circumstances but useful in other circumstances. And we will see this aspect, especially for attention capture dark patterns. So uh, this is the taxonomy proposed by Gray et al. Uh, that stems obviously from the, the website of Brignol. And Gray et al. divided uh, dark patterns into uh, five categories uh, that we will analyze very briefly. Uh, nagging. Um, nagging is a repeated intrusion of a digital service during normal interaction between the user and the system. Um, so the current task of the user is frequently interrupted one or more times um, by other tasks that are not related to the current interaction between the user and the platform. Uh, here is an example extracted from the paper, uh, an example of a nagging behavior on Instagram where a pop-up provides no opportunity to permanently dismiss the message, okay? So there is this pop-up, please turn on notifications. I can say, okay, turn on. I can say, not now, but I cannot say, okay, don't display this message anymore. And so th this information is, is missing and I will constantly receive this, this pop-up. I don't know if it's still the same on the platform, but anyway, at least in 2018, it, it was true. Then there is obstruction. Uh, so through this design choice, uh, designers manifest a, a barrier to the user. Um, for example, encouraging users to pay for premium, premium memberships um, or by disabling uh, expected functionality. For example, 
another example here in an older version of uh, iOS. Um, there is this option uh, for ads tracking. You can disable uh, ads tracking uh, or enable it, but unfortunately this option was hidden in a, a side menu. Uh, you have to click four times to reach this, this option and also um, the name of the labels are not directly linked with this, uh, with this option. Uh, for example, yeah, why should I click on about to reach some uh, option about advertisements? It's a sort of obstruction. Then there is sneaking that is related to the sneak into basket example of before. Uh, so sneaking is an attempt to hide some information, disguise some information, uh, or delay the information that has relevance to the user. Um, so one example, another example besides the uh, sneak into basket uh, pattern that we have seen before, here it's uh, an example of sneaky behavior extracted from some website. So here you are required to um, consent to a privacy statement um, before you can probably unsubscribe from a newsletter. So if I'm, I'm subscribing from something, why should I consent to a privacy uh, statement? But anyway, um, this privacy statement allows Salesforce, in this case, uh, to sell the user information to other countries uh, and if the user fails to read this very small text they would unknowingly uh, sell this, this kind of information to, uh, to other countries. Okay, so it's a sort of disguised uh, information. Interface interference uh, and this pattern is related to any manipulation of the user interface that uh, favors some actions against uh, over others actions. Um, so it's a sort of confusion for the user. Um, and this kind of pattern includes many different sub patterns like um, hidden information, preselection, so items that are preselected by default, uh, and so on. And here is an example of preselection as a type interference, um, as an interface interference. Uh, so for example, here, if I click on, I have read and understood the terms and condition, by default, this oops, checkbox is preselected. Unfortunately, this uh, checkbox is hidden behind this label. So if I don't click here, I don't see the checkbox that is preselected. Okay, so it's surely a dark pattern. And finally, forced action. Um, any situation in which users are required to perform specific action uh, before accessing another functionality. Uh, here is a very common example on Windows 10. Uh, if there are some updates, uh, I'm forced to update uh, the computer, okay? I cannot shut down the computer and turn on again without updating. So designers are forcing users to, to update the PC. This is very bad, for example, if you are going to make a presentation, uh, you unintentionally turn off your PC and then you have to wait hours before your PC is up and running. Another example more related to attention capture their patterns are for example uh, probably uh, ads, advertisements on YouTube or no Netflix, there are no ads, but on YouTube uh, in the middle of a video you are forced to watch the advertisement before uh, restarting the, the video, okay? Okay, this was a very in brief introduction to dark patterns. Do you have any questions? So let's move to attention capture dark patterns that are a particular kind of uh, dark patterns that we are trying to study 
in our search activities, so it's a very recent topic. And all starts with the attention economy, of course, and the digital well-being topic. So the question is, why is our digital well-being undermined by contemporary technology? Uh, and one of the reasons is this business model that is called attention economy, that are followed by many uh, tech companies nowadays. So, as we were saying in the first lecture, our attention is transformed into a currency. So we know that most digital services are free, but we pay for a service with the time we spend on it. And unfortunately, uh, tech companies may sell our attention and also our data sometimes, uh, like in the Cambridge Analytica scandal, to advertising companies and uh, external companies. And this is why this business model is so convenient for tech companies. For example, yeah, Alphabet, that is the company that owns Google, is worth one trillion dollars. Uh, Meta, it's also worth about um, 700 billion dollars. So it's a very convenient uh, uh, business model. And there is also a reason, because traditional advertising, like on TV, is very straightforward. So everyone sees the same advertisements, there is no personalization, and this is not true on digital services that nowadays typically exploit uh, artificial intelligence, for example. So with artificial intelligence, uh, digital services can predict what ads are most effective depending on the characteristics of the user, the previous interaction with the user, uh, between the user and the system, and so on. And so there is this concept of personalization um, that is useful sometimes, but it can also be used to uh, malicious purposes. So ads are personalized according to our previous digital interactions, preferences, and, and so on. And the result is that um, our time on internet in general is continuously growing year by year. Not only our time, but also uh, our interactions with, with this kind of, of services. Uh, for example, uh, the number of tweets on Twitter is continuously growing, uh, the number of uh, interactions with Snapchat and, and so on. Uh, and so, again, these two charts summarize what happens in one minute uh, on internet, in this case in 2020 and 2021, uh, and probably these numbers are still growing today. Um, so there is a, a general strategy here that is adopted by contemporary mm, tech companies to make users increase these numbers. Um, and it's in the usage of persuasive technology. Uh, so persuasive technology can be defined as a technology, as a tool, as a strategy uh, that is designed to change some attitudes or behaviors of the users um, through persuasions uh, and social influence, and in particular exploiting some psychological theory. It was defined by uh, Jeffrey Fogg, that is a behavior scientist at Stanford University. Uh, according to the original definition, persuasive technology is not a bad thing, uh, thing per se, but is used to influence the behavior of the user without explicitly using deception or coercion. So it's a good thing, according to uh, the original definition, and it can be used to improve the relationships between uh, users and technology. And it can be divided in two main strategies, trading and nudging. So trading uh, means that uh, a digital service has some knowledge of the goal of the user um, and present the users with options that are expected to increase both the utility of the user and of uh, the tech company, okay? So, um, the goal between users and tech companies I I is common, okay? Uh, so, for example, the goal of a news site may be to increase its traffic, 
its traffic, but this goal is coherent with the goal of a user that wants to uh, read uh, good news, for example. Um, so if I'm able to improve my results, I'm also able to increase my traffic. So there is coherence between the goal of the user and the goal of the tech company. The other strategy is nudging, uh, and it's a strategy through which a service uh, can influence the decision of the user um, by targeting the biases and the heuristics of, of the user. Uh, and this is clearly more problematic with respect to trading uh, because of this reason, because uh, this strategy tries to exploit the psychological vulnerabilities of, of the users. Um, so when these biases are predictable, and many biases are, are predictable, uh, a nudge strategy can steer a user towards action that are not in the interest of the user, but that are in the interest of uh, the tech company. And this is probably uh, why this kind of uh, dark patterns that we will see in a moment are problematic. Um, so, again, the attention economy, persuasive technology is often exploited to capture the attention of the user and this goal of capturing the attention of the user, uh, I that is the goal of the tech company, is often not aligned with, with the digital well-being of the user, clearly. And again, this is often achieved by exploiting psychological vulnerabilities and the so-called uh, cognitive uh, uh, biases. Do you know what is a cognitive bias? No, we will see some, some example. Um, a cognitive bias is a systematic error in our thinking um, that may occur when we are processing and interpreting information coming from the, from the environment. Uh, and affects, this error affects our decisions uh, that, that we can make. Here, if you are interested, there is a very uh, good visualization of a set of, a large set of uh, cognitive biases. Let me see if I can open it. Yes, you can explore this uh, visualization finding information on Wikipedia about all these uh, different cognitive biases. We are not going to cover them, of course. Um, but again, if you are interested, you can use this very useful uh, navigation map. But just to make some uh, practical examples of cognitive biases. Um, so the question for you is, what is the color of the two blocks, A and B? Which are the blocks A and B? This is A and this is B. Okay. They're the same color. Yes, <laughs> because you, you have uh, watched the, the slides, probably. No, no but yeah. you, you know the trick. Yes. So <laughs> this, uh, yes. So you ruined my, my exercise, <laughs> but it's not a problem. Uh, so again, what's the color? Yeah, you, you now know that it's probably the same color, but visually, uh, even if we know the, the answer, still I'm seeing the first block in gray and the second block in light gray, right? To me, these two blocks are of different colors. Do you agree with me? Okay, you already know the trick. If I add some context um, to the image, these two lines, we can easily see that the two blocks are of the same color, okay? It's a cognitive bias, and it's also called the checker, I don't know how to pronounce this name, illusion, okay? And still, again, if I remove the context, seal, Still, these two blocks seem to me of different colors, right? 
So our brain I is not able to process um, these, the, these, these colors efficiently. Okay? Again, if I add context, I can easily see that the two colors are actually the same. So what we perceive as true depends on the context in which we see it. Another example of a cognitive bias. Uh, so now I'm asking to you uh, to match a reference line, this one on the left, to one of the three comparison lines on the right. So what is this line in this figure? See, are you, su are you sure? There is no trick here, okay? The correct answer is, is C, okay? But uh, there is a well-known uh, experiment in psychology, the Solomon Ash experiment, uh, in which participants were asked to perform the same task that you have performed right now, but uh, after having listened to some actors giving a wrong answer, okay? So, for example, there are three or four actors in this room, me and other three people. Uh, you don't know that we are actors. Um, the uh, experiment, uh, the researcher asked us to match th this line and both of us answer uh, B, for example, okay? And then it's your turn. And the results of this experiment is that over 36% uh, of the participants, after having uh, listened to, to the actors, uh, choose the wrong line, okay? So this is a form of conformity, conformity bias. So we tend to want to conform to the social norms around us, okay? So now the exercise is quite easy. But if there are some actors that intentionally uh, give the wrong answer, this wrong answer then also influence your, your an answer, sorry. Okay, so this is another example of another bias that can be exploited also in, uh, through attention capture dark patterns. So, uh, the usage of uh, persuasive technology may have different uh, negative impacts for users. This is a picture taken from, from this course, again from the um, Center of Humane Technology that I mentioned in the first lecture. Um, so using persuasive technology can uh, uh, lead users to experience polarization, fake news, uh, influence culture, and so on. Again, in this specific course, we are focusing more on the addictive use and information, information overload. But again, the, the topic of digital well-being can be easily extended to many different aspects of uh, the well-being of, of people. And social media exploits psychological vulnerabilities and some of the biases that we have seen um, to capture the attention in, of the users in several ways. Just to make some examples, then we will move to attention capture dark patterns. They create urgency through notifications, for example. They encourage constant seeking, uh, like with the possibility of receiving new comments or likes, and this possibility keeps us in a persistent state of alert. Um, they also encourage social comparison. This is demonstrated every time we receive a comment or a like, our brain gets a dose of dopamine prompting us to compare ourselves with, with others. And in general, uh, today technology is intentionally designed to keep us engaged. Um, and there is a particular strategy here that is offering a mix of old and new content each time. It's a variable reward technique that is used also in, so in uh, slot machines, for example. So, to summarize and have an overall picture of this phenomena, uh, we, conducted, we recently conducted a systematic literature review to define and uh, find a taxonomy of these attention capture dark patterns. Okay? 
So we were interested in giving a definition of these uh, specific design patterns, their characteristics and impacts on people's digital well-being, and also we were interested in creating a typology of uh, a gallery of these, of these patterns. And we recently published this uh, paper in, um, in the CHI conference. It's still not published, but it will appear very soon. So, what is an attention captured art pattern? Uh, this is the definition. A recurring pattern in digital interfaces that a designer intentionally uses to exploit the vulnerability of the user and capture uh, its attention. And this often leads the user to experience um, a lost sense of time and control, a later feel of regret, and it, it may make users to lose track of their goals. Okay, so we also summarize the negative impacts within the definition. The goal of these patterns is to maximize continuous usage, daily visits and interactions like clicks, shares and likes. Uh, and obviously they make users more likely to visit a digital service again uh, and click on uh, similar types of rewarding content. So in the end they create a trap for the user uh, and obviously this is for uh, enabling the goal of the stakeholder, the goal of the digital service. Um, so, uh, what are the exploited strategies and characteristics? Uh, typically these patterns, uh, not all these patterns, but the vast majority of these patterns remove the need for autonomous deci decision making. Uh, by automating in some way uh, the process, the interaction between users and, and these platforms. Uh, an example is the autoplay pattern that some, some of you mentioned uh, before. Okay? So this interaction is sometimes automated, like playing automatically the next video just to make you uh, watch more videos. Um, paradoxically, some of these patterns can also improve the usability of the platforms and this is the reason why uh, some patterns in some cases may also be useful um, but the other side of this coin is that these improvements and simplifications are sometimes a deliberate choice of designers and tech companies um, so there is this trade-off between usability and persuasion that is critical in this, uh, in this domain. Um, again, the psychological vulnerabilities can exploited uh, by these patterns can be uh, different, uh, but these are probably the, the most common. So variable reward, we have seen it before, um, it's uh, if an efficient strategy because even the task of predicting something is itself rewarding and triggers the release of dopamine. For example, the fact that right now uh, I don't know the posts that I will see on Instagram, this is a form of variable reward technique. Okay? So the task of predicting which posts I will see is itself rewarding. Okay? Then there is the reward depletion. Uh, you probably uh, have experienced it uh, several times. Uh, is this a situation in which you scroll through posts and videos that you have already seen while hoping for new content to appear, okay? So after a while on Instagram or Twitter, uh, I start seeing the same posts that I have already seen. So I'm here on Twitter hoping to see new comments, new uh, posts. Maybe I pull the interface to refresh the feed, hoping for new comments to, to appear. And then there is immediate gratification. Uh, so obviously people generally favor the, the choices that offers immediate gratification, like watching a catchy video uh, at the expense of, of long-term goals. Okay, some of the impacts of these uh, attention capture patterns, uh, they promote digital addiction, uh, um, they undermine the attention of the user and also the productivity, as you have probably discovered in the, in the first assignment. 
they undermine the sense of agency and self-control of the users and as was uh, included in the uh, definition they result in a later sense of regret sometimes okay okay this was an exercise but we can discuss without performing the exercise um, considering the definition without looking at the slides uh, how many attention capture damaging patterns or dark patterns are you able to identify in your in your experience some of you already mentioned infinite scrolling the autoplay other examples uh, on instagram when someone puts a story there is a red circle mm -hmm. and after you watch it that circle becomes gray okay Ah, okay, this is interesting. It's not included in the typology, but it's a very interesting uh, uh, idea to consider also this kind of pattern. There is something that uh, I don't know if it's uh, common on Twitter when uh, you are reading some posts and then uh, the app decides to scroll uh, randomly, so you see new posts without doing anything and you have to scroll automatically uh, maybe my device is, uh, a bit, uh, okay I never experienced this uh, this pattern but it changes uh, okay interesting yeah 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 other examples or personal experiences Also, uh, thinking about your first assignment. For example, I think you, uh, in your group, uh, decided to explore the impact of uh, Reels, right? Or YouTube's short videos. So the length of these kind of videos, and in particular, uh, the suggestions of, of these kind of videos, may be also potentially uh, an attention captured our patterns again it's a sort of variable reward technique i don't know uh, the next video and the content of the next video if the next video will be interesting or not to me and so there is this variable reward technique uh, i'm always hoping for new exciting content to to be watched right Mm -hmm. Probably it's not uh, maybe a reason behind the algorithm that is not working well, but maybe you are mm, mm, promoting, you are promoting to continue scrolling the, the YouTube shorts, maybe. So, yeah. Because if you don't like it, you continue to scroll. Okay, so you are saying that, uh, yeah, but again, if at the end there is an interesting content, uh, yeah. uh, I'm encouraged to continue to swipe up. Uh, hoping for yes, but before getting that you have to be frustrated. So yeah. You lose more time. And you yeah, probably. Yeah, but probably uh, the solution could be uh, having some boundaries. So some point in the interaction for the user to reflect on on the current session and maybe decide to stop the session now. Okay, so obviously there are trade-offs. But probably the goal is not to recommend too many videos at the end, right? Uh, I was just thinking maybe some use of notifications, like uh, when Instagram uh, and I think uh, also Facebook does it, like suggest you, you may know this person. Yeah, exactly. This is included in the, in the typology. So receiving suggestions about people you don't know or uh, interactions that you haven't performed on the platform. So let's look at the taxonomy. Um, it's a typology rather than a taxonomy of 11 um, patterns that are reported here. Uh, we tried to use everyday language as suggested by uh, Christopher Alexander um, to spark inspiration for designers and capture also the general public. Um, we specifically focused on patterns leading to attentional arms 
so we excluded, uh, in performing the, the literature review, we excluded all the traditional dark patterns that are more related to financial aspects and privacy aspects, like the one included in the Brig Null taxonomy. Uh, and we also tried to use and specify a specific context, uh, because again, not all patterns are harmful all the time, so some patterns may be harmful in some context and some patterns may be useful in some other context. Um, and this is the, the typology. Um, as you can see, uh, we tried to use um, names conveying the, uh, the right expectation for, for the pattern. I mean, uh, we all know that notifications may, may be sometimes uh, an attention capture their patterns, but not all the notifications are of this type, of course. So we try to specify the, the dark part of each pattern already in the name. So we have, for example, recapture notifications. We will see uh, what they are in the examples. Uh, we have, for example, um, guilty pleasure recommendations. So not all the recommendations are uh, uh, are problematic. Uh, here we are trying to s identify a specific kind of, of recommendations. So let's start with the first one, and probably the most common, you already mentioned it, the infinite scroll, okay? So, um, and here the problem is in the name, is infinite, right? So as the user scrolls down a page, more content automatically and continuously uh, loads at the bottom. So, um, in some way, it decreases the effort required to browse content. So, it's probably a useful feature, especially on mobile devices. But this infinite may promote endless usage sessions, uh, especially if it's linked with other dark patterns like uh, suggestions. Um, again, it exploits variable reward techniques uh, because I don't know uh, which posts I will see in my interaction, so I'm always hoping for new interesting uh, uh, posts and comments and so on. It's very common in, in social media, uh, so this is the, the main context uh, for, for this kind of, of pattern. Again, from the description of these patterns, you, you can also take inspiration for your uh, digital self-control tool um, for assignment two, maybe you can focus on some specific patterns, I don't know. Okay, the casino pull to refresh. Um, okay, you know the pull to refresh interaction. So when the user uh, swipes down on their smartphones, typically, uh, there is an animated reload uh, of the page. And the problem is that this animated reload may or may not reveal new appealing content. So again, uh, an example of this variable reward technique. So users may be tempted to refresh compulsively, hoping to receive new content. Uh, personally, uh, this is a very bad uh, dark pattern for me because uh, I typically find myself on Twitter and so on continuously uh, pull to refresh to see if there are new, new tweets. Uh, and it's also similar to slot machines. Uh, again, this is common in social media. Uh, and this is the, here the context is also linked to a specific device uh, because this kind of gesture is, is typical on mobile devices only. OK, never-ending autoplay. Uh, Again, the problem here is in the never-ending part of, of, of the pattern. A new video is automatically played when the current one finishes. Uh, and the problem here is that there is never a point for the user to stop and reflect. And also, uh, not in YouTube, but in many other services, the option to turn off autoplay is hidden or non-existent at all. I don't know if in YouTube Shorts there is the possibility of uh, disabling uh, uh, the autoplay of the next video. I don't know. Uh, in YouTube, it's very easy. There is this uh, slider here that you can turn off. But in other services, it's very difficult to disable autoplay. For example, in Facebook, uh, 
videos are automatically played by default when I'm scrolling and the option to disable this feature is in a very distant uh, um, item in the settings menu, okay? So in this sense, I've used YouTube as a bad example, but uh, we must acknowledge that YouTube offers this easy way to disable uh, autoplay. Also in this case, there is this uh, nearly always present variable reward techniques. Uh, it also reduces the autonomy of the user because uh, the video is autoplayed, even if I don't want to see a new video. Um, it can obviously prolong usage session. But on the other end, autoplay as a pattern may be useful in some circumstances, like listening to music on YouTube while working, uh, obviously autoplay on Spotify uh, where there are no videos is fundamental. So we tried to uh, get the problematic part of this pattern with this definition and this, this name. It's common on social media, uh, but also on video streaming platforms in this case, Netflix, YouTube, uh, and so on. Okay, guilty pleasure recommendations. Um, recommendations in general, you may know, can, can be based on my previous interaction. In this case, we are speaking about content-based recommendation systems or they can be based on the preferences of similar users. Uh, and in this case, uh, this kind of uh, recommendation systems are called collaborative filtering. Uh, in reality, you nearly always have a mix of these two strategies. So my recommendations are computed um, based on my preferences, but also the preferences of similar users. Um, again, recommendations may be useful, when the goal of the platform is aligned with my goal, and this is the value alignment problem. Uh, so if, if I really have a goal, if I'm using a service intentionally to perform a goal, receiving some recommendations to perform this task uh, is surely useful. Uh, however, they can become a trap for keeping the user attention when these recommendations are used to um, Keep the just keep the user on the platform without any particular goals. Uh, again, the variable reward techniques, common on social media and video streaming platforms, uh, because are the two uh, services in which guilty pleasure recommendations are more uh, problematic. Here you can see uh, the Facebook watch section that recommends to you viral videos uh, according to, I don't know, uh, probably your previous interaction and something like that. Okay, uh, another uh, pattern, these guide ads and recommendations. Um, these guide ads are also present in the Brignull original taxonomy. So this is an extension of the Brignull these guys ads. Uh, and some of you already mentioned this, this pattern. Um, so with this pattern, ads and recommendations are hidden as a normal content, okay? Uh, for example, uh, the sponsor and the stories on Instagram, okay? So this resembles a normal story from, from a user, and there is also a very tiny label sponsored here to notify users that this is actually an advertisement and not a story from a user. Um, Another example, uh, as some of you mentioned before, this kind of recommendations that are disguised as uh, uh, normal posts from your friends. For example, here on Twitter, there is a normal post with some pictures and there is this tiny label you might like that, uh, that means that this is not a post from your followers, from your friends, but it's a recommendation from the platform, okay? Um, with this kind of recommendations, even as normal posts, there is this problem because news feeds become a representation of what the social network expects, uh, will elicit the most clicks, uh, rather than a representation of the preferences of the user, a representation of the world of the, the user with, with their friends and so on. 
Um, and it's demonstrated by, by some experiments that most users are not able to process such a misalignment and are not able to tell why they are seeing some posts in their feeds. Again, this is very common on, on social media. Again, here the problem is not receiving the recommendation per se, but uh, the problem is the recommendation that is disguised as a normal post, deliberately. OK, recapture notifications. Um, so notifications that are deliberately sent to recapture the attention of the user who may be escaped or left a digital service for a while. So they are used as a pretext to make users unlock a device and going into the app uh, to engage further. These kind of notifications are typically activated by default, and this is another problem. Um, and here is an example uh, on Duolingo uh, that it constantly pushing you to open the app and perform some, some tasks uh, just, just to use the, the app. And here is a quote extracted from uh, a paper by links and colleagues about Facebook that says, if I didn't have things popping up every 30 minutes like this has happened in Facebook, I don't think I would think about Facebook. So it's an example of the negative side of, of these recapture notifications that are common probably everywhere on social media, video streaming platforms, and even messaging applications. Yeah. Are these type of notifications also common to apps uh, that are meant to like uh, ensure self control? Okay. If yeah. Think about uh, an app uh, that uh, reminds me of uh, not spend too much time. On yeah. Certain, on, on another app, for example, like in, can you find some of these patterns also in apps? That are yeah, you can find these patterns, so. but this is why the context uh, is important. Okay. So again, in some contexts, these patterns may be useful, like for example, in a digital self-control tool, some notifications that ask you, for example, to check your, uh, I don't know, time spent on your device. That's probably fine. It depends on the context, okay? So uh, obviously, uh, we as researchers uh, should be able to identify in which context these patterns may be, may be problematic, okay? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there is also a trade-off here. Yeah, you, you, you should be able to um, not using this pattern too much. Otherwise, it, it may become I can become dependent from the tool. So yeah. this is a problem that we have seen I in the past lectures. But is also a dark uh, pattern the fact that this kind of notification is more similar to humans? Yes, and there is another uh, uh, example. example. So yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I think the last pattern is exactly this one. Okay, playing by appointment. Uh, this is a pattern uh, uh, extracted mainly from the literature about uh, uh, games and gamification. Through these patterns, uh, digital services force users to use a digital service at specific times uh, defined by the service rather than the user. So. Uh, these patterns are engineered to encourage users to revisit a digital service at a specific moment. Uh, and if you don't revisit uh, these services at specific mod uh, mod um, times, uh, you will probably lose something I in, the, I in the digital service, like the possibility of earning something like points or even the ability to progress uh, in a game. It's common, again, on video games, mostly on social networks, and also on social media. These are two uh, very common examples uh, and useful examples to understand this pattern. Here are social streaks on uh, Snapchat. I don't know if you use Snapchat. Uh, in Snapchat, if you, I think, I don't use Snapchat, but I think if you uh, send a message or a comment or a like to a friend, Every day, you continue your, your streak. Uh, so there is this icon here that says that for 120 days, I have sent some content to my friend. 
and when you, if for a day you don't send anything to, to your friend, this tricks uh, uh, end, okay? Yeah, probably, yeah. Uh, so this is the first uh, example. You are uh, forced to use Snapchat every day if you want to continue the streak. And the other very recent uh, example is Be Real, right? Are you using Be Real? Okay. Uh, so if you take your smartphone here, I know that you are making a, I don't know. But uh, again, you know this this social network, time to be real, uh, so you are forced to uh, probably post something yeah. at specific, okay, a picture every day at a specific time decided by, by the platform. Grinding, force users, uh, it's related to playing by appointment, so it, it has been extracted from, from video games. Uh, it forces users to repeat the same process several times to unlock an achievement, okay? So digital services consume the time of the user and the attention of the user uh, by promising a, li a later achievement, like a new, level, a new level in a video game or a badge on social networks. Um, this is an example that I found uh, in the website of my credit card. I don't know if you have Nexi. Uh, but you can earn some points probably with your purchases uh, and then in the website you can open these surprise boxes I don't know um, and there are some special sur uh, surprise boxes that you can only uh, open at specific time and after having opened um, a given number of uh, the other kind of uh, surprise boxes, okay? So I'm forced to play this game just to being able to open the big surprise box. So this is an example of grinding. We are nearly at the end. Attentional Roach, Roach Motel. Again, Roach Motel is already included in the Brignull uh, taxonomy. We have already explored it before. Um, again, it describes a situation in which it is easy to get in and hard to get out. Uh, it may be exploited to make, for example, account settings difficult to access, like the one related to autoplay, uh, or also to hinder the possibility of logging out from a, a service, from a system. Uh, so this pattern affects how alternatives are perceived uh, and they promote a predefined action that is, please stay on the platform, um, and may also exploit deceptive visualizations that leverage uh, the science bias. So um, designers can use visualizations for some buttons and other visualizations for other buttons just to make users click on the buttons in line with the goal of the uh, digital service. It's common on social media. For example, this video yeah, probably describes all the steps that you need to deactivate or cancel a Facebook account. You must perform, I think, five or six different steps. And then at the end, when you click on cancel my account, you still have 30 days in which if you access Facebook, uh, your account is automatically reactivated, okay? So it's probably um, a strategy adopted by Facebook uh, so that if I'm, for some reason, uh, go on Facebook, even if I don't want, uh, my account is reactivated by default. Okay, some of you already mentioned this example, time fog, we called it in this way. So designers deliberately induce unawareness uh, by reducing autonomy of, mon of monitoring user time spent. So, uh, practically, designers uh, try to hide, reduce the possibilities to get some feedback about the time spent by the user on the platform within a given session, um, like by hiding the video lapse of time. Here is uh, an example of, uh, taken from uh, Netflix, for example. Um, you know uh, the time you need to complete the video, 
but you don't know the time that you have already spent on, on, the, on the video, on the, on the, on the platform, okay? Um, and this increases the chances of longer usage of sessions. Also in this case, uh, this pattern may exploit deceptive visualizations, and it is particularly common on video streaming platforms, um, and I think probably also on some uh, mobile games that, if I'm not wrong, uh, hides the, the clock of the smartphone uh, when opened full screen. This is the example that you was mentioning before, fake social notifications. So deceive users with false social activities and information. So these are digital services platforms that pretend to be real users. So you are receiving notifications that resemble notifications from real users, but um, instead are from the platform. Um, and we also included notifications about activities of unknown people. Um, and this pattern in particular violates the expectation that uh, if I receive a message, this message should come from a real person, right? Um, we also mentioned some biases. Um, they are common on video games, social media and messaging apps. And these again are two examples. Um, here, for example, on Twitter, you can have this kind of suggestions about uh, users that are tweeting after a while. Um, here is an example from Telegram. Uh, I'm receiving a message that is encouraging me to send a message to these people that is just, uh, it has just subscribed to, to, to Telegram probably, but why should I send him a message? So probably you had another example. But it's not. Okay, thank you for the suggestion. I, I can. Because we have the picture, we have the name, but. But it's not a real user. Okay, so it's probably a, a better example here. I will probably replace these two figures with your with your example. Okay. Any questions? Is there any kind of regulation or attempt to regulate this kind of? Uh, yeah, we will see this topic. Uh, I think. Uh, next time? Um, no, the, the answer, the brief answer is no, but there are some proposals uh, and it's clearly this is a, a very new topic, uh, but our goal and the goal of uh, most of the researchers in the XCI area in this specific topic is exactly to promote um, for example, new design strategies, new design guidelines, new policies, new uh, regulations against this kind of, of pattern. So this is probably uh, the goal of all this uh, research on the digital wellbeing topic. So starting from the problems of digital self-control tools that we have analyzed uh, in the previous lecture, the goal is to try to uh, encourage, especially tech companies, to avoid this kind of problems, this kind of patterns, and start designing technology that align with people's digital well-being. Uh, so probably there are no specific regulations against these dark patterns, but there are some proposals, especially in the US, I think. But we will see more in, in, the, next, uh, in the next lecture. So the goal here is to, um, for example, uh, for privacy aspects, after the Cambridge Analytica scandal and, and so on. Uh, there are now uh, strict rules, uh, especially in Europe with the GDPR. So an example could be following this kind of regulations and policies also for this specific domain. There are some proposals, but obviously it's a new topic, so it, it takes time to, to become established. Then. Okay, so I think we can uh, take the break now and then you will have uh, I think two hours if you want to work on your uh, project assignment two uh, and if you, if you need help I'm here uh, and that's it.